Welcome to the Bible Made Clear and our next discipleship class. So this is actually part three of um, the reliability of the New Testament. And we have been going through um, these seven E's, uh, which I actually got from Frank Turek. So I have to say thanks to him. But uh, in doing this, um, it's a tremendous layout of evidence for the New Testament. We looked at the early testimony. We went through the, uh, the transmission of manuscripts, the, the sheer quantity of manuscripts. We heard from uh, Daniel Wallace, uh, Craig Bloomberg, uh, Gary Habermas. So, uh, and these are the guys that are the experts that know. They've been doing this many, many years. And... Um, uh, the, the evidence for the New Testament is obviously uh, overwhelming, actually, uh, when you actually put it in perspective. Now, we've come to the second E, which is eyewitness testimony. So what is that? Well, um, it's evident that what is written in the Bible is written by eyewitnesses, people that were there. This is not something that was fabricated after the fact. This was not something that was um, legend after, you know, uh, a few generations when the, really the only time legend can be established. So here's Luke 3, 1 and 2. It says, now in the 15th year, and I've underlined the significant pieces here, which is most of the verses. Um, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Iturea, and the region of Trachonitis, um, uh, Traconitus, and uh, Licinius, uh, Licinius uh, Tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. Notice that's plural. Uh, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. So, um, this is in reference to John the Baptist. Now, if you look at this, obviously, this is not just uh, mythology. This is, um, well, let's see what's written here. Does this sound like uh, Luke's making up a story? No, of course not. I mean, look, you have people outside of the Bible. Uh, they're not just Bible characters. These are people, actual people from history. Uh, you're dealing with... Um, even the fact that Annas and Caiaphas were high priests at the same time, though only one was the legitimate one, the other one actually was one that had the authority. Um, so, I mean, you had this kind of mix of political power there um, with the Jews uh, among the leadership. So uh, there's some interesting pieces here, but you're dealing with um, statements of fact. Excuse me. You're dealing with statements of fact that uh, it's evident um, this has to be in a time uh, while these people are alive at the time that they're performing these functions. Otherwise, it would be immediately dismissed. This thing would have never uh, survived the first century. Um, an exact date is given, right? A.D. 29, the 15 year, 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Uh, eight people are known from history. Uh, all were known to live at the exact time. Uh, this is not a once upon a time story, which should be a myth, right? So <clears throat> if we move on, that's in the Gospel of Luke. If we move on to uh, kind of Luke part two, which is the book of Acts, um, we have 84 historically confirmed eyewitness detail in the book of Acts alone. And, um, and these actually are, for the most part, from the second part of Acts. Now, Luke includes um, several others in his gospel. John has 59 historically confirmed or historically reliable or probable eyewitness details uh, in his gospel. Um, the New Testament documents cite more than 30 people confirmed by secular sources or archaeology. In other words, it's not possible to write something this interwoven into actual history uh, and pretend it's a myth. If it was a myth, 
written at the time that it would be easily dismissed because once you add um, an attempt at eyewitness details, uh, if you're not there, you get them wrong because you're just making it up. And the same with the people involved, that you're basically pulling from outside history into the story. So this is really, uh, like I said, you wouldn't have survived the first century if these uh, were myth documents. So out of these 84 uh, historically confirmed eyewitness detail, uh, really in the second half of Acts, um, I'm not, you know, obviously you can see them there. What I would normally do in a class is I would, you know, kind of highlight the red ones that you see pop up there. Uh, we'll be here all day if we walk through those. Um, this is out of, um, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Um, and so these are, these are actually quotes from uh, Harold Honer. So as we go through here, uh, you know, some of the red ones uh, uh, are my favorite. Uh, I think, you know, they kind of uh, pop out to me anyways. But you can see them uh, just kind of lighting up there on the screen. And uh, of particular interest when we get near the end, which I always thought was interesting, um, Number 63, the best shipping lanes at the time. There are different ways that you can travel around the Mediterranean. But at that time, uh, they picked the, um, the best shipping lanes to go as Paul was on his way uh, to Rome. And um, the right route to sail in view, that's number 67, of the winds because of the problem they were having. Uh, the locations of Fair Havens and the neighboring site of uh, La Serra. Uh, a noted tendency of a south wind in these, uh, in these climbs to uh, back suddenly to a violent northeaster, uh, the well-known Gregale. So, in other words, these are things that you would have to be there and understand from that time. Uh, writing, it would be no different than, uh, you know, something culturally that is said uh, at a particular time today, and then later on it's changed. But, you know, how would you know? How would you know that you were from? How would you know that you're from New England? I mean, there's certain New England terms that we use that other people don't use in the rest of the country. So, um, you know, uh, in the 80s, I worked for IBM. I had to travel around uh, for some aspects of my job. And, um, you know, I would either be down south or out west. And, you know, I would say something and they'd say, oh, you must from, be from the northeast. Because uh, I lost some of my, my Boston accent uh, when I spent three years in the Army. So uh, sometimes it was a little difficult to tell where I was from. However... Um, I've got a lot of it back uh, over the years. But the point being is that the, the terminology I used at times, not the way I said it, but the actual term um, isolated me to New England uh, because there are certain terms that we use up here apparently were a bit different. But anyways, um, so as you go through these, um, <clears throat> I just think some of them are, are more interesting um, especially number 76, the precise term, um, and you get the term there, for taking soundings and the correct depth of the water near Malta. Uh, how would they know that, right? So that's when they were, uh, they ended up being shipwrecked and, you know, proper titles and everything else. So um, anyways, the, the issue is, is that we have, 84 of these in the book of Acts. Um, and now Luke reports a total of 35 miracles in the same book in which he records all 84 of these historically confirmed details. So now the question, right? Um, now, why would Luke be so accurate with trivial details like wind directions, water depths, and particular town names, but not be accurate when it comes to important events like miracles? In light of the fact that Luke has 
proven accurate with so many trivial details, it is nothing but pure anti-supernatural bias to say he's not telling the truth about the miracles he records. As we have seen, such a bias is illegitimate. This is a theistic world where miracles are possible. So it takes much more it makes much more sense to believe Luke's miracles miracle accounts than to discount them. In other words, Luke's credentials as a historian have been proven on so many points that it takes more faith not to believe his miracle accounts than to believe them. And I think Luke is a premier historian which has been borne out borne out by his writings. So uh, these are the 59 in John. Again, I'm not going to read through them all. Like I say, the red ones um, are particularly interesting to me personally, which I point out when I'm walking through them in a class. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I'll just kind of pop through them here. If you want to stop the video and read them, you know, you're more than welcome to do that. But let's see. Um, now... In 25, it says Caiaphas was indeed the high priest that year. We learn from Josephus that Caiaphas held the office from A.D. Uh, 18 to 37. So, but we also know that Annas was involved also. So, anyways, as we go through here, um, you know, number 38, the name of the high priest servant, Malchus. Uh, who had his ear cut off, right, by Peter, um, is an unlikely invention. I mean, why would he give him a name? Why would he um, risk that if he was trying to put something together that was just fabricated? Uh, because Malchus would have to be a person, would have to have happened, otherwise he could say, no, they're all lying. Um, so anyways, I mean, you... you you know, you see the point here. So anyways, here's the, the rest of it. So now, at the bottom here, it says, when we couple John's knowledge of Jesus' personal conversation with these nearly 60 historically confirmed, historically probable details, there is there any doubt that John was an eyewitness or at least had access to eyewitness testimony? It seems, it certainly seems to us uh, that it makes a lot more, it takes a lot more faith not to believe John's gospel than to believe it. So, again, you know, we have this uh, from, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Also, um, we have more than 30 people confirmed by secular sources or archaeology, and you can see that, um, again, from the same book. And here they are listed out, you know, Agrippa one and two, Annas, uh, Ananias, Annas, um, Aretas, Bernice. Uh, so you can read them right down the page there. Uh, we'll flip to the t page two. And there you have it, there's 31. So um, the, the evidence of eyewitness detail is pretty clear. I think that... Um, it makes the case, okay? Uh, this is not a myth. This is not just something that was fabricated. Um, though I know, unfortunately, the Bible writers get accused of that all the time. The third one is embarrassing testimony. Now, this is interesting because embarrassing testimony um, is things that they say about themselves that uh, normally, if you were trying to create a story, you wouldn't would make yourself into a buffoon, but they, uh, they're writing how they were dim-witted. Um, in other words, they fail to understand what Jesus is saying. And then you get the references in the Gospels there. They were uncaring. Uh, they fall asleep on Jesus twice, right, when he asks them to pray. They make no effort to give Jesus a proper burial, right? They scatter. Uh, they're rebuked, right? Peter, Peter is called Satan. Um, Paul rebukes Peter about being wrong about a theological issue, Galatians chapter 2, talking about not living the gospel right. Um, they're cowards, right? Peter denies Christ three times. The disciples run away. The women are the brave ones. That would be the exact opposite of what you would normally have 
uh, in a Middle Eastern document that you were trying to promote a whole new religion, the last thing you would do, uh, since women at the time were considered uh, in that culture uh, as not having the same credibility as a man, as an eyewitness. Um, they were doubters, right? Uh, so um, despite being taught several times that Jesus would rise from the dead, you get the verses there, the disciples are doubtful when they hear of his resurrection. <laughs> Only the women seem to have any faith. Unfortunately, it's still like that today. Some are even doubtful after they see him, right? Like Thomas. So, um, Jesus was considered out of his mind by his own family uh, who came to seize him and to take him home. It's in Mark 3. Um, he was deserted by many of his followers, right? John 6, 66. That was after he fed the 5,000. Uh, he was not believed by his own brethren, right? They were kind of mocking him, telling him to go up to the feast. If you're the Messiah, go show yourself. Um, he was thought to be a deceiver. Uh, he's accused of that in John 7. Uh, he turned off Jewish believers to the point they wanted to stone him. Well, that happened more than once, but this references John 8 at the end of the chapter. Uh he was accused of being demon-possessed and mad, right? John 10, that's also like in Matthew chapter 12. He was called a drunkard, Matthew 11. He was called demon-possessed, right? Uh, you can add Matthew 12 to that. And um, he had his feet wiped with the hair of a prostitute, which could have been looked at as a sexual advance uh, and easily misunderstood. And he was crucified despite the fact that anyone who hung on a tree is under God's curse, according to Deuteronomy 21. So, again, um, these are not the kind of things that you fabricate, uh, that you put into a story if you're trying to convince people that you have somebody that raised up from the dead, and that, uh, but they haven't, but you're going to do it, you, you're going to diminish the, the credibility of, of the entire story and their own witness to those that they'll be sharing and then writing to uh, by putting these things in if it's not real. Now, if it's real, it doesn't matter. If it's real, you just write what's accurate. You, um, you know, you publish that and it doesn't really matter because Jesus did rise from the dead. And regardless of what people think, um, you know, the, they're going to maintain the same story. It's it's the same thing when, um, you know, when detectives um, catch two people in a crime. They separate them. They put them into two different rooms and they start asking them questions. Now, they're allowed to actually lie in the interrogation. You know, that's legal. They can um, they can tell them things that are false. Now, the reason that is, is because. If you have not committed a crime and you're sitting there and they say, well, you know, like we have your fingerprints, so you might as well confess. Well, if you weren't there, they can't have your fingerprints or, you know, some evidence that you were there if you were never actually there. But if you were there and you're lying to them, then th even though they may not have physical evidence that you were actually at the crime scene, if they tell you they have it, see, you're wondering now. And then when they tell you, well, you know, the deal only goes to the first one that confesses, then you're going to be motivated to confess because you know you're guilty. Well, it's no different, really, than dealing with this. I mean, if you're going to write a story that you want people to believe, um, yet the story is false, I mean, you, you want to make it interesting. You want to make it so that there's heroes in it. Uh, you don't make yourself look like an idiot. Um, but yet these, these uh, Gospels, the way they're written, will only have credibility, only if Jesus actually rose from the dead, and if the historical details that they're putting into them align with what is real at that time. Otherwise, there's no sense in writing it, you know, because they're just immediately dismissed. <laughs> Hey, Brian. Hey, how's it going? Good. 
so, great presentation. Uh, you left me with enough things that I want to respond to that if I did, we would be here all night. So I'll just narrow it down. Brian's the head of the Secular Student Alliance, so there you go. We, we had yeah. dinner, so yeah. say hi to Brian. There you go. Hey, SSA. Hey, Brian. Go <laughs> ahead. Uh, so yeah, there's just a couple points I want to, uh, I guess, focus on mm -hmm. that uh, really stood out to me. So you, you put a lot of emphasis on the uh, embarrassing details. Yeah. So I have a couple points that I just want to list out real quick and then just get your response to. Sure. Um, there's a number of examples in ancient mythology that uh, of embarrassing details. Like, for example, the, in the account of Hercules, he has a fit of, of rage and kills his family. Mm -hmm. uh, in, the writing of, in the writings of Homer, well, not really writings, but in, in you know, the works of Homer, mm -hmm. uh, Odysseus's men, his soldiers are often presented as a bunch of bumbling idiots who get him in trouble. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, of course, Josephus uses women as, as source material when he's writing the Jewish war, like in his account of Gamala, for example. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering if... If we know that uh, an ancient writer who lived in, you know, in Jerusalem or in at least in Israel around the time of Jesus, who was a respected historian, used women, then doesn't that mean that women occasionally were trusted as as uh, historical sources? And then the presence of uh, embarrassing details of characters and heroes in, like, for example, uh, Greek mythology, doesn't that kind of well, yeah, when you're talking about mythology or mm -hmm. just like a novel, yeah, you're going to have a lot of embarrassing details. That's what it's right. about. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's, it's about making it more interesting if it's a novel. So then my question is, how does that serve as a standard for what's historically accurate, if it also occurs in mythology? Well, because the embarrassing detail argument doesn't stand alone. It stands with all the other E's that I put up there, okay? Well, Which shows that, that they're not writing mythology. Mm -hmm. They're writing what they believe to be true, and then they go and die for it. Right, so, so I understand that you can build a case for the resurrection, or you can build a case for the historical reliability of the New Testament mm -hmm. Gospels. Yeah on the basis of these other criteria, but then the embarrassing detail kind of falls away, doesn't it? Because oh, no, 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 it occurs no. in other, other mythology. That oh, wasn't no, no, well, if, it's, if, if it was mythology, but mm -hmm. see, we know that Hercules or whatever you mentioned is mythology. We know that. Mm -hmm. This is being put forth as true, and these are historical characters, which, by mm -hmm. the way, in our book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, which I know you have, in, uh, <laughs> in chapter uh, 10, I think it is, maybe 9, we list more than 30 historical characters in the New Testament documents that are also in secular sources and or archaeology. So mm -hmm. this is a story about real life. It's not Homer or it's not Hercules. It's not mythology. This is put forth as being true. And then there's other evidence that it's true. As you know, being an archaeologist or somebody interested in archaeology, you know there's mm -hmm. archaeological evidence for some of these things. Right. But the existence, you know, being able to verify the historical existence of a person doesn't necessarily mean that you've verified every account of oh, every that's detail true. of their life. You can't verify everything in the New Testament or the Old Testament. You can. Mm -hmm. But when right. you get enough evidence to suggest that they're telling the truth, you can take the rest of that and go, well, if they're telling the truth here, they're probably telling the truth here. You know, if you don't have, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, I would really recommend that you get it. Um, the, the information about the New Testament alone is worth the price. So uh, I think, you know, um, you know, the whole book develops a tremendous argument, and I think it's great. But I think in particular, uh, the New Testament information is certainly phenomenal. So I would certainly recommend it to you. Have you ever lied to make yourself look good? Yeah, of course you have. Now, have you ever lied to make yourself look bad? No, you would never do that. And the principle of embarrassment goes like this. If there's something embarrassing in the text, it's probably true because the authors would never make themselves look bad, just like you would never lie to make yourself look bad. Well, the New Testament documents are filled with embarrassing details that they never would have invented. For example, the New Testament writers depict themselves as dim-witted. They don't understand what Jesus is saying. They don't understand his mission. In fact, they don't really get his mission until he's already ascended to heaven. And then they go, wow, I could have had a V8. You know, up to that point, they didn't know. Peter, their leader, is called Satan by Jesus. That's embarrassing. And of course, Peter says, look, Lord, I'll never deny you. What does he wind up doing? He winds up denying the Lord three times. This is their leader. And then if you look in Galatians chapter 2, you see Paul rebuking Peter for being wrong about a theological issue. 
Why are two apostles arguing over theology in the Bible if they're making this up? They're not. It's embarrassing, but they're telling the truth. And then at the crucifixion, the disciples run away. Why would they run away? Why would they admit they ran away? They wouldn't. It must have really happened. And then the first witnesses at the tomb are women. Why would they invent that? In fact, in that culture, a woman's testimony was not considered on par with that of a man. So if you were making up the New Testament resurrection story, you'd only have the men be the first witnesses. Yet all four Gospels say the women were the first witnesses, which is telling us what? They really were. They never would have invented it. Never would have invented that. In fact, I had a woman come up to me once and she said, I know why Jesus appeared to the women first. I said, why? And she said, because he wanted to get the story out. And then if you look in Matthew chapter 28, verse 17, this is two verses before the so-called Great Commission when Jesus is standing there and he says, go therefore make disciples of all nations, that passage, as they're standing there, it says the disciples, some believed, but some doubted. How did that verse get in the Bible? He's already resurrected and they're doubting it's him. Do you think they invented that? No, it's embarrassing, they're just telling the truth. There's even embarrassing details about Jesus. In Mark chapter 3, his own family thinks he's out of his mind. They want to come and seize him to take away. Jesus' family does. Now, you may have heard people say, the scholars say that the New Testament writers invented Jesus to be God. Really? Then why are they saying his own family thinks he's nuts? And he's also called a drunkard. He's called demon-possessed. He has his feet wiped with the hair of a prostitute, which easily could have been seen as a sexual advance. And oh, by the way, do you know there are two prostitutes in Jesus' bloodline? Rahab and Tamar. Do you think Matthew and Luke got together and said, you know what, I really think we need to spice up the Messiah's bloodline a little bit. Let's put a couple of prostitutes in there. No, I don't think so. They're just telling the truth as embarrassing as it is. You will never see this in a Pharaoh's bloodline. You will never see the Pharaoh being called a drunkard, being called demon-possessed, or having prostitutes in his bloodline. Any Pharaoh would chop the heads off of his historians if they ever said that. But the New Testament is telling us the truth, as embarrassing as it is. You want the ultimate no-spin zone? Read the Bible. Well, that was well said, wasn't it? So, <clears throat> moving on to excruciating testimony. Um, this is going to be obvious in a minute. So, what did the New Testament writers have to gain by making up a new religion? You know, this really goes under the MO, uh, which is really MMO, right? Uh, when you're trying to discover whether somebody committed a crime um, they use <clears throat> the mo they look for that means do they have the means to commit the crime the motive to commit the crime and the opportunity uh, they may have had the means you know in a particular crime but if they can't find a motive and if they had no opportunity certainly then they could not be uh, a suspect so you know you really have to apply look at this like a detective because um, you know when I go through the New Testament I say that there's really only three groups of people right there's the Jews that were against Jesus there were his disciples and then there were the Romans okay um, if we look at it from the standpoint that if one of those groups had the body um, what would be the motive of the Romans and the Jews that were against Jesus not to reveal it? They could have ended Christianity, forgive the pun, it would have been dead out of the starting gate, okay? Wouldn't have gotten anywhere. Um, so that only leaves the disciples. If the disciples took the body, then <clears throat> now this, this, these excruciating uh, this painful aspect to their testimony um, makes no sense at all. I mean, you would have to have a, a massive amount of people just kind of buying into this, this really unnatural human response uh, if, if they had stolen Jesus' body. So they're going to they're gonna basically 
ruin their own lives uh, and die claiming they saw him rise from the dead when they knew he didn't that's that's ridiculous um and but we'll we'll get into that but we have some questions here like what did the new testament writers have to gain by making up a new religion if they're just faking it what what was in it for them right they already believed they had the true religion. They already believed that Yahweh was the true God. That, you know, it wasn't like they they felt like they had a false religion and needed to convert over to a true one. That wasn't the issue. Why would they risk persecution, death, eternal damnation by defecting from Judaism? Because if 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 you were leaving Judaism for a new religion, it's a false religion. Now, the New Testament reveals that Christianity is not a new religion. It is the prophetic outgrowth and anticipation from the Old Testament. Okay, so they're connected together. Uh, it's, it's really the, the new, it's a new covenant that God brought in under Christ. But if it wasn't, I mean... Basically, they're going to be persecuted for doing it. They know that because uh, they know that there's going to be Jews that believe that they are um, following, if they don't believe in Christ, that they're following a false Messiah. And then that they know that results in persecution. It can result in death. And if, if, it, if it were true that Jesus did not rise and they were just creating this religion, they know that they're... Um, they're basically going to end up going to eternal damnation because they're leaving Judaism. I mean, they're, they're going against the law. So <clears throat> there's just a lot at stake here that makes absolutely no sense unless Jesus actually did, in fact, rise from the dead. They had every motive to say the resurrection did not happen. In other words, if it did not, uh, they had no motive to invent a new storyline. Submission, persecution, servitude, and death are not motivations to claim Jesus rose from the dead. In fact, they when in fact they knew he didn't. So if he didn't actually rise from the dead, uh, to, to claim that he did is, is basically to raise your hand in that culture and say, please ruin my life, send me to hell, uh, torture me, persecute me, and kill me. I mean... It, Where's the motive for that? That that's now one person doing that. Sure, they can go insane and do that, but thousands? No, no, that's not going to happen. It doesn't work like that. Why would they die for a known lie? Right? People die for lies all the time, but they believe that they're dying for something that's true. Now, look, there's been martyrs in a number of different religions, but they believe what they're dying for is the truth. If the, if the disciples had the body, then they would be dying for a known lie. Now, that's insanity on a massive scale, which just, again, um, I, I don't have enough faith to believe that anybody, even like lunatic people, uh, would believe it on that kind of a massive scale. Um, just doesn't make any sense at all. It's crazy. No one dies for what they know is a lie, especially in multitudes of people claiming to have seen Jesus rise from the dead. Um, they went to their grave claiming that they saw him. All scams break down at the point where death is a possibility. That's the reality of it. Because the advantage of a better, richer, more advantaged life is no longer viable, which a scam offers. But the disciples carried the claim of Jesus risen to their deaths. Look, there, we know in our culture, in our world today, people run scams for everything. I mean, you actually begin to wonder how many people are actually working legitimate jobs because it seems like there's a massive quantity of people that are just criminals running scams so, um, and doing things that are dishonest. So aside from probably the limited people paying into the tax base. Um, the issue is, is that the, the scam breaks down when it loses its advantage. Well, 
if the disciples are scamming here, they never had an advantage. They never had one advantage. Nothing. Zero. So, uh, again, it doesn't make any sense. Another reason we know the New Testament writers are telling the truth is they died for it. They went through excruciating deaths to say that Jesus had resurrected from the dead. They could have saved themselves by simply saying, look, it never happened. Now, these people were Jews. They already thought they were God's chosen people. Why would they invent a resurrected Jesus? Why would they do that if it didn't happen? And then go to their deaths saying that it happened. They wouldn't. You see, many people will die for a lie they think is the truth. There are many people that will die for their religion, but they think it's true. But nobody will die for a lie they know is a lie. The New Testament writers were in a position to know whether it was a lie or not, and they went to their deaths anyway. Why? Because they saw Jesus. They touched Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They verified with their own senses that Jesus had risen from the dead. They were there and they went and died for it. Remember, they're Jews. They had no motive to make this up. In fact, the New Testament writers did not create the resurrection. The resurrection created the New Testament writers. There would be no New Testament if Jesus had not risen from the dead. Why would Jews invent this? They wouldn't. They went to their deaths because it happened. And you can believe it as well. So, if we look at the apostles prior to when they came uh, to faith, right, uh, it's going to be different than afterwards, right? So, let's do before and after. Let's make the comparison. So, before, they practiced animal sacrifices. They were under the Mosaic Law. Uh, after, well, Christ's sacrifice fulfilled that, so they no longer needed to do that at all. Uh, the law of Moses was binding on their life, and afterwards, Christ's life, his example, and what he taught became the rule that they lived by, which is not the Mosaic Law. Uh, they were strict monotheists. Um, though the Old Testament provides information of the plurality within the Godhead, they did not understand, nor were they taught, that there was a trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the Godhead. In the New Testament, now, afterwards, they did. They believed that. Before, they honored the Sabbath. They went to temple every Saturday or synagogue. Uh, then they moved to Sunday worship. Acts 20, verse 7 tells us that that was the day they worshiped, the first day of the week. And Paul referenced this in 1 Corinthians 16, 2, when he said, when you get together on the first day of the week, blah, blah, blah. He's talking about... Um, the collection that they were making for him. So um, that's when the early church met. Different, right? Um, they were looking for a conquering Messiah before Jesus showed up. Uh, they ended up with a sacrificial Messiah that they accepted because he paid for our sins. Before, circumcision was a requirement because that was the sign of being under the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, afterwards, it was baptism and communion. Uh, Acts 15 tells us that Moses' law and circumcision and everything was not required by Gentiles uh, because that was not part of the new covenant. Uh, they were baptized to identify themselves with Jesus Christ, and then they practiced communion. Now, what would motivate disciples of Jesus to make these abrupt, drastic changes unless they knew Jesus has risen from the dead? Obviously, there's really nothing to motivate them. So if we go on to expected testimony, what would we actually expect from them if Jesus rose from the dead? We should expect, um, through reason and science, we know that God exists and created us for a purpose. So we should expect testimony about the Messiah through this, through our own reason and what we understand scientifically, we know that God exists and created us for a purpose. That we know. Uh, you don't even really need the Bible for that. We have to be created for some purpose. God had to have a purpose. The Creator would not just arbitrarily create. Uh, nobody does. 
So we know that working <clears throat> effect back to cause. We've gone through that in earlier videos. The creator obviously had to have a purpose. That would be points one through three, right? Um, and then the Old Testament predicts the Messiah would come in hundreds of prophecies, right? So you have predictive prophecy, which is very powerful evidence. Uh, not only does it validate the Old Testament because it's telling you something that's going to happen ahead of time and then it does, but then the New Testament uh, reveals the fulfillment of many of those prophecies. Since the Old Testament teaches the same about the Messiah, the New Testament reliability verifies the Old Testament prophecies. They work hand in hand, but the Old Testament is really validated uh, powerfully by the New Testament fulfillment. So fulfilled prophecy connects both the Old and the New Testament together, which is the issue. Old Testament prophecies. When we look at Christ, uh, there's a who, right? He was human from Abraham's line in the tribe of Judah. He's a human being, right? And those are the referenced verses. He was God from eternity, right? To be born in Bethlehem. Uh, again, Micah 5.2, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And then the New Testament passages in Matthew 2 and uh, John 7. How? He's born of a virgin. Now, theologically, that was necessary because sin comes through the man. Uh, Paul tells us in Romans 5, For by one man sin entered into the world, and death came upon all men, for all have sinned. Um, death is the result of sin. It happened in the garden when Adam sinned. Um, he deliberately sinned. Eve was deceived. The sin is assigned to Adam. And now the only thing that he can produce in his offspring is sinners. That is circumvented by the virgin birth. The, the seed is still planted into the woman uh, the way it would normally have been um, to gain a pregnancy. It's just the delivery method was different. That's really the only difference. Uh, but the seed, once it's there, takes on the normal nine months pregnancy, grows normally, and then the baby is delivered. But it's the method and the source that are a little bit different as far as the delivery system, right? The Holy Spirit put that seed there as opposed to another human being. Because another human being would have just passed on the sin nature uh, from Adam. Why? To defeat Satan and death. I mean, that's what everybody is stuck with here as sinners, and that's why Jesus came. So if you want to believe that, you believe that he was a substitute. He came to live the perfect life, fulfill the law, all the requirements against us, die a death in payment for our sins in our place because him being sinless, he could do that. Uh, being sinners, we, we can pay for our own, uh, but that's going to be an eternity in hell. So we can certainly avoid that and be delivered from that by our faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is the Savior of the world. When? Now this is from the book of Daniel. Um, if we start at Nehemiah 2, uh, if you look at Daniel 9, 24 to 26, it talks about from the going forth, this is about Israel, uh, in Jerusalem, from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, when he would arrive and announce himself as Messiah. You start in Nehemiah 2, right, um, which um, is really the starting point um, from Daniel's perspective. And you have to do it in days, you have to convert, because we do things. 364 and a quarter days a year. The Jews and the Babylonians use 360 day calendar. So if you do the, the day conversion from Nehemiah chapter 2 um, and um, Sir Robert Anderson, he went through this calculation in his book uh, The Coming Prince. You can get that, that book. I think it's even online um, for a free download. You can search for it. But you get 173,880 days. So factoring in the leap years and everything else, you get, you start um, March 14th, 445 BC, you end up uh, Matthew 21, 
Jesus coming in on a donkey, fulfilling Zechariah 9.9, that prophecy, and that would have been April 6, 32 AD. Now, scholars differ. Uh, some shifted off a year, but I mean, let's be realistic here. Shifted off a year either way, uh, you're still coming to the same place. I mean, that's the amazing thing, whether it was you know, 444 or 445 and you end in 31 or 32 AD, what is the difference? Um, shifting one year either way. Uh, the point is, <clears throat> is that after that 173,880 days, the Messiah arrived. And uh, so Daniel's prophecy bears that out. <laughs> Though it may not always look like it, this is no ordinary town. Long ago, a prophet foretold what would take place here, and then, centuries later, it happened, just as he said it would. The Bible says that only God knows the future. So if we are told what will take place before it happens, then that's not man, but God who is speaking to us. Just before 700 BC, the Old Testament prophet Micah prophesied, But you, Bethlehem, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler of Israel. Around 700 years later, the New Testament declared Micah's prophecy fulfilled when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. In regards to Jesus being born in Bethlehem, early historical sources outside the Bible include Justin Martyr and Origen. Origen talks about local people of Bethlehem taking Christians to this site in Bethlehem and pointing out that this was where the Savior God of the Christians was born. In about 150 AD, Justin Martyr wrote that Jesus was born in a certain cave. In about AD 248, Origen also wrote of Jesus that there is shown in Bethlehem the cave where he was born. Caves were often used as a place to keep animals and are commonly found near ancient houses. When the time came for Mary to give birth, the Gospel of Luke says there was no space left in the guest room in the house. And so the text implies that Jesus was born among animals, since afterwards he was laid in a manger used for watering and feeding animals. Therefore, the details in Luke's Gospel fit well with the early tradition that Jesus was born in a cave. So we know this much for certain. The cave, which would be a lot like this cave that Justin Martyr and Origen wrote about, is the same cave that then later in about 326 AD, Emperor Constantine builds a church over the top of to commemorate this cave as the birthplace of Jesus. Now, this church stands for a long time, but eventually it's destroyed. And then just after 530 AD, Emperor Justinian rebuilds this church, and uh, with many repairs and restorations, this is the church that has still stood until today, some 1,500 years later. Currently, archaeologists are digging in Bethlehem next to the Church of Nativity. This is the southwest corner of the Church of Nativity, and here in front, this is where we're digging. We're sinking a trench down to early levels. And we have, without doubt, pottery dating from the time of Jesus. What we've been able to prove up till now is the existence of a village from the time of Jesus. This is very important. The earliest copy of Micah's Bethlehem prophecy was found preserved on a Dead Sea Scroll fragment in this cave and dates to 125 BC. Therefore, the fragment containing the prophecy of where the Messiah would be born is over a hundred years older than the event that fulfilled it when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The Church of the Nativity is built on the site traditionally where Jesus was born. Historically, it's got really good credibility as being the place where Jesus' family lived and he was born right here. So there's no question, without doubt, it's a historical event that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. It's also known without doubt that centuries before this historical event, Micah accurately foretells it. 
What this means is that the Bible is telling us accurately the future. It's telling us what is going to happen before it happens. No man knows the future. This is impossible with man. Only God knows the future. And so it shows us that God is speaking to us through the Bible. And therefore, this evidence that we've covered not only speaks to the historical accuracy of the Bible, it also speaks to the authority of the Bible as God's Word. That was uh, that was a, a great uh, contribution there, and um, I really like how they did that. Uh, you can get that stuff uh, on his channel on YouTube. So that is uh, Joel Kramer. He is uh, the uh, Expedition Bible. Uh, that's expeditionbible.com. You can go out there. Uh, he also has stuff on YouTube, but uh, he's got some pretty interesting stuff. Um, uh, so he gets into all the archaeology. And moving on. If we look at this prophecy regarding Christ, um, we see that he was going to come from the human race. This is the first prophecy, right? Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman will uh, crush the serpent's head. The woman has no seed. That's a virgin birth, right? We see the ethnic group within the human race. Uh, he's going to come from Abraham's seed. Then the tribe. So you go through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob has his 12 kids. And the fourth tribe, the tribe of Judah. We learn that in Genesis 49. The dynasty within that tribe, so you, now you get the family of David that he's coming from. Uh, how, right? Virgin birth, which we saw. Where? Bethlehem. And then when Daniel targets it. So, I mean, there's nobody else that is going to fit all those. Um, they become very narrow, and that's only a few. So there's obviously many more. Only Jesus will fill that, fulfill that. So... Um, Peter Stoner, this is actually uh, pretty fascinating. Peter Stoner, originally published, and again, you can get this book online. This is from Chapter 3 of his Science Speaks, which was done many years ago. Peter Stoner calculated the probability of just eight messianic prophecies being fulfilled in the life of Jesus. As you read through these prophecies, you will see that all estimates were calculated as conservatively as possible. So these are the eight he picked, right? Uh, he did it with a class. He was a professor. Uh, born in Bethlehem. Um, a messenger to prepare the way, right, which would be John the Baptist. Enters Jerusalem riding on a donkey. We mentioned that, right, Zechariah 9.9. That would have happened on Palm Sunday, what we call Palm Sunday. He's betrayed by a friend, again, Zechariah. Betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Again, Zechariah, that's what Judas betrayed him as. The betrayal money was used to buy a potter's field. This is not even something that Judas could have influenced where he went out and hung himself. Um, he made no defense for himself, right? Isaiah 53, the Messiah will die having hands and feet pierced, Psalm 22. So multiplying all these probabilities together produces a number rounded off of 1 in 2.8 times 10 to the 28th power. Dividing this number by an estimate of the number of people who li lived since the time of these prophecies which would have been about 88 billion produces a probability of all eight prophecies just eight now you got to realize there's um in independent witnesses there's over 300 prophecies of christ's first coming um many of those are duplicated by the different eyewitnesses in the bible but even if we put them at 60 to 100 unique ones, I mean, we're talking just eight here, um, produces a probability of all eight prophecies being fulfilled accidentally in the life of one person. That probability is one in 10 to the 18th power or one uh, with 18 zeros after it 
Uh, in other words, it's mathematically impossible just for these eight, never mind um, any of the others that are on top of it. So these prophecies don't include hundreds of other ones, uh, like I said, that are put in there. So extra biblical, outside the Bible. We're almost to an hour, so I'm going to uh, come to an end here. But um, we have, you know, uh, two more of these to go. Uh, and so next time we meet, we'll go through uh, the testimony from outside the scriptures, which um, is also amazing. So uh, as you walk through these, realize that you're putting together a package of um, testimonies that is really irrefutable. At least it is as far as I'm concerned. You have to erase history to avoid this. So Look, until next time, may God richly bless you as you continue to study his word.